After an amazing finish to 2022, Dean Kramer came out the 2023 season and certainly earned a rotation spot. It was up and down, but he proved to be a solid pitcher again for the O's. But can he take that next step moving forward? We'll talk about that, plus an injury-riddled season for Keegan Aiken, coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Their Orioles fans, today is Friday, November 17th, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. We're going to be joined by Zach Spedden in just a second to review the season's of Dean Kramer and Keegan Aiken. But first, this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50 plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. So today, our Orioles 2023 season player review series rolls on as Zach Spedden joins us from the On the Verge podcast that covers all things those minors and major leagues. We're going to talk about Dean Kramer and Keegan Aiken. But Zach, first of all, thank you for uh, joining us and welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me on, Connor. And so we're going to talk about Dean Kramer mostly. I know people probably don't want to hear too much about Keegan Aiken, although he is still on this 40-man roster. He has survived kind of the first round of players being outrighted off the roster this offseason, so he is still there. But we'll start with Dean Kramer and take a look back at his season because, Zach, let's start here. You know, it was... I would say a consistent and healthy season for Dean Kramer, which I think is, is the number one good part for him. Like he was able to make 32 starts. You know, he was pushing 180 innings. That's a great year for Dean Kramer. But when you look back on his 2023 season, which was coming off that roaring finish to 2022, what do you think is the one thing you'll remember most about Dean Kramer's 2023 season? I feel like when you look back at Kramer, that playoff game aside, he generally had a knack for winning games the Orioles absolutely needed him to win. And you could find several instances of this along the way. I mean, this, you know, something that kind of jumped out at me about him is that the way he goes about it is seemingly very simple. It's basically minimize hard contact, throw strikes, work efficiently. When he does that, he is the guy that the Orioles often needed this year, which was someone who could go out and stretch out, you know, for six innings. And, keep the offense in the game, hand it over to the bullpen, and secure the win. Um, you know, the, I think the playoffs game, just different circumstances all around. But if you look during the regular season with Kramer, you see a lot of high points, but then the low points could get pretty low. Um, a lot of issues with the long ball, which I'm sure we'll talk about tonight, and that's still something he's going to have to work on. Yeah, I think for me, you know, I think in 10 years – Dean Kramer might be wrapping up his big league career and after signing, you know, a few one year deals with different teams. And I think we might look back to this year and say that is when Dean Kramer proved that even as he ages, he could be an innings eater in Major League Baseball. I think that's what I'll remember from this season, because, again, like the stats weren't incredible. It was a 4-1-2 ERA, 32 starts, 172 and two-thirds innings. His ERA minus was 98, which basically means ERA-wise, he was slightly above average as a starting pitcher this year, which is a useful play, right? If you can get 173 slightly above average innings, that is very, very helpful for a 162-game season. He did give up some homers. You know, the fly balls flew out of the ballpark at times, and again, we will get to that. But I just think he showed this year, especially with the way he pitched, and the way he was able to get deeper into games at times, that he wasn't hunting too many strikeouts this year. As you mentioned, he was throwing strikes. He was throwing mostly fastballs, which I also feel like can kind of help him as he moves forward. He's got three different fastballs that he goes to a lot. I think he showed us that, you know, the Orioles are going to want more innings eaters, right? They're going to want, you know, they upgraded from Lyles to Gibson at the very least this offseason. They got to upgrade from Gibson to someone else probably. But I think they showed us that, you know, even if Dean Kramer just remains an Oriole for the final four years they have with team control, he could be at the very worst like a league average innings eater. And if Dean Kramer is your number five starter for the next four years, I feel like the Orioles are probably in good position if that's the case. Exactly. You know, I 
my expectations for Kramer in the minor leagues were relatively high in the sense that I thought he'd be a major league starting pitcher, but I never looked at him as an ace. Uh, and you look at what the Orioles pitching staff looks like right now. They have two guys that have that ace type potential in Grayson Rodriguez and Kyle Bradis. Hopefully they'll add a third top tier starter to that mix this off season. But going forward, I don't think that Kramer has to be the number one or the number two or probably even the number three in most years, to be an effective pitcher for the Orioles. I agree with you. If he's a back-end starter who can eat innings, that's going to be valuable. I Here's the one thing that on the flip side kind of worries me about Kramer. And, and, and let's start with the home runs and the ball in the air. For a guy that kind of introduced a sinker, right, and throws a good amount of cutters as well and kind of mixes his fastballs, for a guy who's trending towards innings eating, his ground ball percentage was under 40% this year. Like he's certainly a, a fly ball pitcher at this point in his career. And the ball does leave the yard off his bat. Now he the home runs were less of an issue down the stretch this season. And that showed first half ERA 478, second half ERA 3.25. And the home runs did go down. But, you know, they got a new ballpark in Baltimore with the left field wall. So that helps a fly ball pitcher. But you know, what do you think contributes to that? How much do you worry about a guy like Kramer who throws a lot of strikes and also can tend to give up a good amount of home runs? Well, I think that that's really the underlying question with him is can he find a way going forward to keep the ball in the ballpark? And what I look at is when you look at his pitch data, the cutter is generally a useful pitch for him, but it's the pitch that get, results in the most home runs this year followed by his fastball. And I don't know what the answer is going to be for him. Does he need to be more selective about when he throws the cutter? Um, but it just seems like there's something not quite right there. When you look at a guy who has two pitches that are generally effective that account for all but eight of his home runs given up last season, 10 off the cutter, nine off the fastball, that's something that the Orioles are going to have to figure out going forward because – when those pitchers are on, they're very effective. Uh, but something's got to be done, I think, to cut down on the home run numbers. I mean, you look at his home run to fly ball rate. I was surprised when I looked it up today, 13.9%, which is a little high, but it's not astronomically high. So it's not like you could look at that and say, well, he was really unlucky in that area this year. That's probably only slightly higher than it would be in a good year. So there's clearly some work that has to be done with those pitches. And that's kind of what I focus on. It's just either it's throwing them in the right counts more often, throwing them the right batters more often, or just doing something different with them. Because those are the pitches that when he's struggling, those two are, it's because those two pitchers are off. Yeah. I wanted to talk more about the pitch mix. You brought it up. Four seam fastball cutter sinker were his top three most used pitches this year. He introduced the sinker at the end of last season, which really helped him finish those last two months really, really strong in 2022. And he kept it in the arsenal this year. And it, it worked at times, but he was a very fastball heavy pitcher. Like among any Orioles pitcher, he was probably the most fastball heavy guy. I mean, there were times when, you know, 80 plus percent of his offerings were one of those three pitches and all different variations of the fastball. We had heard about kind of the 12 6 curveball when he was coming up through the minor leagues. It's kind of a pitch he's not completely gone away from, but you'll rarely see it. He'll toss a changeup in against lefties, but I've kind of noticed that with the changeup, he almost waits till the third time through the order to start throwing it to left handers. He kind of sits on that pitch for a while. And then the sweeper, remember, he kind of found that sweeper at one point and then got rid of it. So I wanted to get your take on the pitch mix. Like, is that a sustainable mix where? There are times, even when he's rolling, right, when he's getting through six, seven innings, it's three different fastballs. I get it. It's still changing speeds. It's still different pitches. But he's really only throwing three variations of a fastball. And it does worry me a little bit. Like, you need some off speed at some point, I think, to get through a big league lineup that many times. Yeah, I agree with you. It feels like you need to look at either the change up, the sweeper, or the curveball as something he's got to rely on. And it's odd because when Kramer was coming up in the minor leagues, the curveball was sort of identified as his out pitch. Now, it's not unusual for a pitch that looks like it's going to be the you know good secondary in the guy's arsenal and take a little bit of a back seat when he gets to the major leagues. I mean, Kyle Braddis, that's happened to an extent where the slider has sort of overtaken the curveball. But I, you know, the fastball variations that Kramer throws 
are good to probably get you through an order a few times a night if they're effective, but he's got to have something in his back pocket for the night where the cutter is not working or the sinker isn't working that he can throw his curveball, his changeup, or his sweeper more to work around that. That's really going to be the key for him going forward is trying to find that fourth or that fourth and fifth pitch that's going to work for him. So we'll talk more about Dean Kramer and, and kind of what his role could be, how he'll have success moving forward with this Orioles team in just a second. But first, this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast is brought to you by Jace Medical. Now we get questions about what Jace Medical is. Essentially, this is a company that is here for you when you need it. Jace Medical, their number one product is called the Jace Case. You can go on and order it. Basically, select the medications that are best for you. You can get five different life-saving antibiotics sent right to you, and you can have them for whenever you need them. And the Jace case allows you to mix and match with different medications to put in your case to customize the one that is right for you. And if you or someone you love would like to get some peace of mind by having a year supply of any daily medication, go to jacemedical.com and see if it's offered for you. And remember to use the promo code locked on for $20 off your purchase. And again, jacemedical.com, that's J A S E medical.com. So we are back here with Zach Spedden of the On The Verge podcast covering all things Orioles, him, Bob Phelan, and Nick Stevens every single week on their feed. I've been on that podcast a few times and tend to have all three of them on this pod as well. And Zach, we're talking Dean Kramer here in his season. And we kind of went through, you know, what he did this year. And again, you know, it was a, a 21% strikeout rate, right? That's like uh, about league average-ish. It's an 8% walk rate for him this year. It's about league average-ish. And we did a nice job there. Here's what worries me about Dean Kramer moving forward. And this is something I talked about a lot on this podcast and just discussing the Orioles throughout this season. Dean Kramer seems to be always playing with fire. And sometimes there are just pitchers that what they throw stuff wise doesn't look like they should be effective major leaguers. And just with their ability to locate and mix speeds and mix pitches, they can get through lineups. And Dean Kramer is like that sometimes. He's never going to have a lot of 10, 12 strikeout games, but he can give you six, seven plus really good innings at times when he's mixing his pitch as well. But when you dig deeper into the data, there's not really an elite pitch in the arsenal. There's some good pitches. There's not an elite pitch. And also all of the peripherals are very, very scary. And this is something I talked about a lot this year when Dean Kramer had a really, really bad start to the year. He was kind of struggling in the first half. He found it in the second half, but as we know, that playoff start for a multitude of reasons did not go well at all in the Orioles final postseason game in Texas. But you look at his baseball savant page and you know you get all of these kind of expected stats and deeper stats that look at you know swings and misses and chase rate and you know average exit velocity and the launch angle against him and the hard hit rate. And none of it is even in the 50th percentile in all of Major League Baseball. It's like there's not really one thing he does well, yet for two years he's gotten guys out. So I guess the question here is, do you believe that Kramer is one of those pitchers, and they exist throughout the league, that just beats their projections and their peripherals every year, and there's just something about them where they're able to do it? Or are you worried that something may come crashing down at some point here for Dean Kramer? I think that with the supporting cast that Kramer has now, he's going to be able to sustain that on some level. The Orioles defense is not great, but it's generally solid. And I think it's actually going to get better here over the next year or two. Um, and then he's got a good bullpen behind him. He's got a lineup that should put up runs. That's why I think though, that when I mentioned earlier that Kramer is not an ace, that's probably what the separation is going to be. He's always going to be that really good number four, or number five, because, he, as you said, he's always playing with fire. Um, and he can put together those six, seven inning outings with one or two runs, then go back and out the next start and give up three over four and two thirds. I think you're always going to have to live in the margins a little bit there with Kramer, where some starts are going to be really good, some aren't going to be very good, but you just hope the end result when the season is finished is you know giving you some value. Yeah. And, and, you know, some of it is he does avoid some hard contact at opportune times. And, and that's that's half the battle in pitching is kind of a, avoiding that contact. I think really the the other thing about Dean Kramer here is that, you know, whether or not it kind of blows up in his face here, he's going to get a chance at some point here 
And Kramer in general, you know, he's going to have a chance on this team. You would think either way next year, Zach, in, in 2024. But you kind of look at the starting pitching options, right? Bradish and, and Rodriguez, they're locks. You know, whether it's one and two, two and three, depending on what the Orioles bring in, they're going to be in this rotation next year. And then you've got, you know, what does John Means give you next year? You've got, got Dean Kramer in this mix. You know, you have a guy like Cole Irvin in this mix. You lose Kyle Gibson. But he, here's a question. How many, like, legitimate starting pitchers? This doesn't have to be aces. But starting pitchers who the Orioles would go get and you would say, all right, that they brought this guy in because he's going to be in the rotation this year. How many of those additions would the Orioles have to make this offseason for you to question Kramer's rotation spot in 2024? I would say two, because right now when I'm picturing the Orioles rotation, I've got Braddis and Rodriguez at the top. Means definitely has a spot as long as he is healthy. And by all accounts, he is at this point. Um, and then you have Kramer there because... I would put Kramer ahead of Tyler Wells at this point because Kramer has at least been able to get through a full season. I'm inclined now to go with D.L. Hall as a reliever. Um, so for me, Kramer is solidly in the top five. Now, if the Orioles go out and they add, you know, let's say someone who's going to slot into the first or second spot of their rotation, and they decide on top of that to go out and get someone who fits the Kyle Gibson mold. Then Kramer's situation starts to become a little bit more complicated because are you going to put him in the rotation ahead of John Means if Means is healthy and back to his old self? Probably not. Uh, you're probably looking at Kramer at that point as a bullpen guy. But I don't know that the world's going to take that path, and I also don't know that even if they do, you can guarantee a full back-to-form season from John Means this year. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think it would take two additions of like guys who are definitely going to be in your rotation. But I do think if they did make two additions, you know, say it was a trade for a Dylan Cease at the top of the, the rotation, and then they went and got, I don't know, a veteran, uh, you know, there's plenty of names out there, like a, a Hunjin Ryu or someone like that at, at the back end. I, Kramer's spot could be in danger, certainly, at that point. And I actually talked about this a little bit in a roundabout way on yesterday's episode. I had Herb Lawrence on of CHGO Chicago White Sox. And we kind of made up a mock trade for Dylan Cease to get him to the Orioles with his two years of control. And Herb, who does a great job, he's covered the White Sox for a long time, talked about how you know the Sox continue to say, like even though they're kind of tearing things down, Jerry Reinsdorf does not want to go into a full, full rebuild. So he's looking for players who are more either young big leaguers now or guys in AAA who are almost close to the bigs. And we talked about how the Orioles might be a great trade partner because they have so much talent in AAA and young talent in the big leagues. But one thing Herb said is, if the White Sox deal cease, they will need a big league pitcher back in that deal. Because he said right now they have two returning starting pitchers, Dylan Cease and Michael Kopech on the roster. So the question is, if the Orioles had to deal away Dean Kramer to get one of these starters, right, whether it was the Brewers needed him to replace Corbin Burns for now, or the White Sox needed him to put it in there, and, and Kramer wouldn't be the only piece, there would clearly be another prospect going in one of those deals, would you be willing to put him in a trade like that to kind of continue my conversation from yesterday's episode, just because I don't think, you know, he's got four years left. I don't think he's a stone cold lock to be in the rotation for the next four years. For me, the answer would depend on what the Orioles are going to do in addition to that, because if you give up a guy who right now is pretty solidly in your rotation, who gave you close to 180 mm -hmm. innings of fairly effective baseball last year, you've got to find a way to replace that. And if I'm looking at the depth chart right now, Tyler Wells has struggled to get through full seasons and back-to-back -back years as a starter. We know he has the stuff to be a good reliever or a good balk innings guy, but whether or not he's going to settle into the rotation is in doubt. And while I like Chase McDermott and Cade Povitz a lot, I don't think either one of them is going to be ready on opening day next year. Certainly not Povitz and maybe not McDermott. Justin Armbruster is kind of in the same bucket for me. So you would have to figure out, all right, you're going to go out and you're going to go get Dylan Cease. You're going to get Corbin Burns, whoever it is. That's great. You've made the top of the rotation better. But you're in the toughest division in baseball, and you've got a hole in the middle of your rotation now that you somehow got to fill. So, that would, so my answer would be probably yes, contingent on going out and getting another, another starter. And that may just mean bringing Kyle Gibson back. Yeah. Is this a scenario I could live with? But I don't know, you know, if that's in the cards or not, because if someone gave Jordan Lyles two years last offseason, 
they probably do it for Kyle Gibson this offseason. Yeah, and it was the Kansas City Royals, which operate separate of other teams sometimes with the decisions that they make. But you, you make a good point. And I do think bringing back Kyle Gibson would not have the sting it would have for some Orioles fans if it was because, hey, we also just traded for Dylan Cease at the top of the rotation. Like That would be very different than, hey, we're just running it back with Kyle Gibson. That's our uh, that's our rotation addition. So last Dean Kramer question before we quickly get to Keegan Aiken to finish things off here. Take yourself forward to September of 2024. The Orioles are competing for a postseason spot. Where is Dean Kramer on this team? Is it any of, give me any of one through five in the rotation, or is he in the Oriole bullpen? I'm going to say number four starter. Uh, so still in the mix, still a guy that's there for your um, bulk inning outings where you can count on him to go out when he's effective and give you six or seven innings. Maybe not the guy you want on the mound in a really tight spot, but I think he's still solidly in the rotation somewhere with a upper threes, low fours ERA, good walk numbers, strikeout numbers, probably sitting about where they did last year with, eight and a half to nine per nine innings. Um, just a really solid back of the rotation arm. That's where I see Kramer September of next year. Yeah. And you mentioned at the top, right? Like he pitched in some big games. Obviously the playoff game didn't go well, but like he pitched the division clincher. He pitched the wild Rays game, the playoff clincher and pitched well in big spots in both of those games. He can do it. I'm going to say number five starter where he's still eating those innings. And then I think they would move him to the bullpen in a postseason scenario next year. I think that would be kind of my Dean Kramer prediction. But all right, Zach, let's finish things off with Keegan Aiken. As we've been doing these, you know, season review series, basically I had the guest pick, you know, the, the better player that they want to talk about. And I slide in with a less significant guy that we're also going to add on at the end of the episode, a guy who is still on the 40 man roster. And that guy is Keegan Aiken, because if you can remember all the way back to 2020 and 2021, these two guys were always in the same conversation because they came up around the same time in 2020 to join the Orioles rotation and both had a little bit of success in that 2020 season. And then their path started to diverge just a little bit. Kramer went to AAA. Aiken was here but wasn't very good in the big leagues. Then Kramer figured it out last year as Keegan Aiken had a great first half and just kind of fell apart in the second half. And then this year, Kramer just kind of you know didn't have an amazing year, but he established himself. And then Keegan Aiken had more struggles, had a back injury in June that kept him out for the rest of the season. So the first question for Keegan Aiken is, you know, he is still in this 40 man, right? The Orioles just outrighted Taron Vavra and Tucker Davidson. The 40 man is down to 36. Aiken's still one of those guys. Does he get to Sarasota on the Orioles 40 man roster? And then follow up, does he get to opening day on the Orioles 40 man roster? So right now, I would say that, yes, he will get to Sarasota on the 40-man roster because it feels like the Orioles, if they were going to make that move to outright him or DFA him, they would have done it already. And it was also kind of telling to me that Trey Mago, who I thought the Orioles were going to protect with a 40-man roster spot, was left off um, because I thought Mago, not right away, but by middle of next year, could be that up-and-down lefty that sort of supplants Aiken in his role. But the Orioles don't have him on the 40-man roster, which to me means they don't see him being anywhere close to that in the first few months of the year. So at that point, there is still a role for Aiken. Now, as for whether or not he makes the opening day roster, I'm inclined to say no, because I do think that the Orioles are going to add to the rotation somehow this offseason and add to the back end of the bullpen, which is just going to squeeze him out. And I think that his value to them at that point will become either as a starter or a bulk inning reliever at Norfolk that they can bring up early on in an emergency. Now, if he goes down there and pits as well, he could make a case for a regular roster spot later on, but I just don't see it happening on opening day. Yeah, I actually kind of think he might not survive on the 40 man. But on the flip side, I actually think if the Orioles try to outright him or DFA him this offseason, I think someone will claim him. Because if you kind of dig a little deeper into the stats, listen, you know, before he got injured, he was a full time reliever coming into the year. He made that one weird uh, bullpen game start, but 23 and two thirds innings, 6.85 ERA, also a 2.96 FIP, which is, yeah, it, you know, it's a small sample size, but that is a wild split between your ERA and your FIP there. And that's because he had an above average strikeout rate, 24%, and he only walked 6% of his batters. Like he continues to throw strikes. Now, when he got hit, he got hit hard this year, and that is why he gave up so many hits and so many runs when he was out there. 
but the fastball still plays at least a little bit, right? It's kind of deceptive. It's got the high spin. You can throw it up in the zone. That slider was kind of a nightmare for him this year, but you know, if you can figure out either that or the changeup, he could still be a big league reliever. So I think he's a guy where, you know, you look at the O's right now, four open 40 man spots. They, you know, it's a question on whether or not they would add four more big leaguers to this team. I think that's right around like where the over under might be for how many guys the Orioles add. But when you think about also Mike Elias is always searching the waiver wire, him and Eve Rosenbaum all over the waiver wire, even for guys like Tucker Davidson, who they can claim and two weeks later DFA and keep in the org at some point when you're adding legitimate big leaguers, which even if they're, you know, Adam Frazier, Kyle Gibson types, they're guys who you're going to add this off season. You're going to run out of space. And I feel like on this 40 man right now, now that Davidson and Bobber are off of it, you know, Zach, when you look at the 40 man, like I don't think there's many guys ahead of Aiken in the pecking order of like next guy who could get cleared if they needed a roster spot, right? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it, if you look on the pitching side of things, would Bruce Zimmerman get DFA'd? Before yeah, that's Aiken probably the other score? name. Yeah, you know, that, that's one guy that I would look at, but. Yeah, I think that that's a fair point. There probably aren't a lot of those kind of guys. I guess what I fall back on is that they've had the opportunity so far this offseason and haven't done it. But that doesn't mean that they won't because they find someone else later on that they want to pick up on a waiver claim. So that's a fair point. Yeah, and and to, to be fair, they've had more than opportunities just this offseason. They had opportunities last season. They had opportunities last offseason. They still see something there. I think it is how deceptive his fastball is from the left side and his ability to pitch as a reliever with still like some starting background in the big leagues. And I think they still see him as an up-down guy, and I believe he might still have an option year, which makes him a little more valuable. Like If he was out of options, he'd probably be gone by now, but he still has that, which makes him valuable. And I think you're right. It's going to be a tough squeeze Like right at the end. He's going to be one of those last choices. But I do think, even if he does survive on the 40-man, I don't see him. I agree with you. I don't see him as an opening day guy. It's Keegan Aiken. It is what it is. I, I do love that we've gotten to the point now where Keegan Aiken is more of a fringe guy. You know, does he hold a 40-man spot versus, hey, is Keegan Aiken going to be one of the starting pitchers um, in the Orioles rotation? That is a much better conversation surrounding Keegan Aiken. But Zach, thank you so much for joining us once again on the podcast. Before you go, um, I know a lot of my listeners listen to your podcast anyway, but for those who don't, let them know where they can find your pod and, and when that comes out. So for the rest of the offseason, we're actually going to be recording on a different night. We're going to be recording on Wednesday nights at 8.30. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and now TikTok. Um, we'll have our live shows out weekly. And then wherever you get your podcasts, you can find our shows after that. We've got a little surprise in the works for next week. Uh, I'll tease that, but it's going to be something interesting that we don't usually do this time of year. So certainly looking forward to it. Sounds great. Yeah, the On The Verge podcast does a great job covering all things Orioles. After you've listened to Locked On Orioles as your first listen of the day, go check them out as well. That'll do it for today and do it for the week here on the podcast. I am Connor Newcomb and that is Zach Spedden. We thank you so much for listening to this one. We'll be back Monday. Mailbag is open again, so make sure to get those mailbag questions in. And also, we're talking about the non-tender deadline, which comes up later today. Orioles have a couple of candidates, maybe Ramon Arias, Jorge Mateo, maybe Keegan Aiken himself, who we just talked about, but whoever they do or don't non-tender, we'll discuss it on Monday's episode. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.